Good morning, church family. If you have not found a seat yet, uh, please come on in and find a seat. It's going to be a good day. We have a full room, and we're going to get to worship together. I'm excited for this morning. Here at Trinity Baptist Church, we exist to proclaim Christ, to make disciples of those who claim Christ, all for the glory of Christ. And if you are a visitor with us today, we are so glad that you could join us. We want to ask you to do us a favor. If you could take the blue top visitor card in the pew rack in front of you and fill out that information, that's a way for us to get to know you a little bit better. And you can drop those completed cards in the giving boxes in the back of the room. Or even better, you can take them out those double doors to our welcome center where there are some people that would love to get to meet you this morning. If you're joining us on the live stream, we're glad that you're with us as well. And I want to encourage you to fill out our connect card. You can just click that link and fill that out. And that's a way for us to get to know you as well. Well, for our call to worship today, I want to read for you from the Word of God from Colossians 3, verse 16. It says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Church, that is what we are here to do together this morning. We are here to sit under the preaching of the word of God. We are here to sing praises together to our God, and we are here to love one another as Christ loved us. So church, let's stand together this morning and let's join together in song. Author of sound. 
shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you but for you who fear my name the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall besides this you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. 
Would you please be seated and raise your eyes up to the baptistry as we continue to worship through the ordinance of baptism. Good morning, church family. What an incredible day today as we celebrate in one worship service together. Three families we get to celebrate new life with today. First is Langston Selman. Langston, come down here, please. Langston is a sixth grader, and we are so excited about what God is doing in her life and her family's life. She is the daughter of Galen and Jackie Selman, several family members sitting right out here, several siblings as well, mostly adult siblings at this point. Uh, Langston was actually born here at this church, so she has grown up here, and we are so grateful for what God is doing in her life. Langston, I have a question for you. What is your profession of faith? That Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Based on your profession that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, I baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in the newness of life. Okay, next, next we have Colton Sanderson. Now, Colton is a third grader. Colton's family has been here for 12 years or so, and we're so excited about their family as well. Why don't you stand on there, Colton? People can see you better. <laughs> Colton is the son of Caleb and Alicia Sanderson and several siblings and family sitting on this side. We're so excited that they're here today with us as well. Colton has been very, very excited about this day. In fact, we met about a month ago, had a great conversation, gave him a, a workbook to kind of work through and think through, a workbook that usually would take about eight weeks, and he wanted to finish it in a month. So here we are today. Uh, and this is a really fun thing that I've mentioned to you before. The very first person I baptized here 15 years ago was his dad, Caleb Sanderson. So we're really excited about how God is working. In their family, uh, Colton, what is your profession of faith? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Jesus is your Lord and Savior. So Colton, based on your profession that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, I baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in newness of life. Finally, we have Crew Silhan. Crew is also a third grader, and he too, their family has been here about 12 years. Crew is the son of Dustin and Jennifer Silhan. Uh, they have uh, some family there sitting somewhere as well, and we're so grateful right here near the front, very, very front, okay. So, uh, wonderful family, uh, great friends, and this is an exciting day for them as well as us as a church. So, this is Crew. Crew. What do you believe? What is your profession of faith? Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. Amen. Jesus died on the cross to pay for his sins. So based on that profession, that you're trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, I baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in newness of life. What a fabulous way to continue to worship this morning. Let's stand together once again as I read Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Would you read this with me? If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Yeah. 
God, I thank you so much for giving us this uh, time to come to you. We thank you for being our source of strength. We thank you for being the God who controls every hour, every minute, and every second of each day. We thank you for your will. We thank you for your divine plan. We rejoice with the three who were baptized this morning, knowing that baptism itself doesn't produce salvation but baptism is a glorious recognition of the work that you have done in lives. We thank you so much for the life ahead of those three. God, multiply their ministry as they go through their lives. Let them carry the gospel on their lips as they go about their lives. Let them reach many people for you, for you and your glory. God, we thank you for all you do. In your name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Amen. Thank you, praise team, for leading us this morning in our singing church. Great to see everyone. Please turn in your Bibles to Acts in chapter 20, if you will. Acts in chapter 20. Well, I suppose the term is universally understood amongst most Christians, though I've found that it is maybe more commonly used in the South or in the deep South. Uh, it's been used as a category to describe various levels of Christian maturity amongst different people. What is the term? Well, the term is the backslidden Christian. Now, many of you are shaking your head because you know what we're talking about when we talk about the backslidden Christian. However, if we're just honest, people use it in different ways. Right? Some people use the term backslidden Christian to describe someone who has completely fallen away from the faith. Maybe someone who has, as the scriptures would say, apostatized. Others would use it as a term to describe a more or less acceptable category of being a follower of Christ. The, the, the term would be used like this. Oh yeah, oh Johnny, he's a good old guy. You know, he doesn't come to church anymore and... You know, he's divorcing his third wife. And, and by the way, you don't want him around your children with that potty mouth. No, no. But, but I remember the day that he was baptized, you know, back in 1974. You know, everyone in the church was just crying when they came forward, when he came forward to get saved that day. You heard that before. You've heard things like that. Of course, others use the term to describe someone who is genuinely, genuinely a believer, but it's kind of deceived and maybe living in rebellion against God and they just what they need is to wake up spiritually they need to recognize their sin they need to repent of their sin well it may be helpful to know that the term backslidden is actually not used in scripture however we might see several characters in scripture who would fit the bill depending on what definition we're actually trying to assign to the term. But what is undeniable is that Jesus and the apostles and the New Testament writers oftentimes will call us as followers of Christ to stay awake. They'll call us to be alert. They'll call us to be vigilant because the enemy is near. They'll call us to keep following, to be passionate about following Jesus Christ. 
This morning as we look to Acts chapter 20 verses 1 through 16, we're going to see some keys, I believe, to staying awake spiritually. Keys to staying awake spiritually. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Acts chapter 20 verses 1 through 16. After the uproar ended or ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Phyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Titius and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed seven days." On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, And taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And he went, and when he and when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Essos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for he had So he had arranged, intending himself to go by land, and when we met at Asos, he took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos, and the day after we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, even on the day of Pentecost. Will you pray with me? Lord, now we're turning our attention to your word. We have celebrated you. We have celebrated salvation. We have celebrated uh, the glory that you deserve. We have celebrated the hope that we find in Christ. We have sung of your glory. We have sung of your mercy and your compassion. We have sung on your holiness and, and your character. And now, Lord Jesus, we look to you to speak to us. Through the power of your word, and the presence of your spirit, would you transform us? Would you keep us spiritually awake? In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. What on earth are we going to glean from this passage? I mean, it's just a, it's just a travel list, right? I mean, there's so much traveling there. And then you got a guy who falls asleep during a sermon, which we'll come back to here in a few minutes. <laughs> Hopefully that's not a, a, a prophecy for this morning. That, well, actually, some of you are probably thinking, well, I know, I know. If you want to stay spiritual awake, you're, you're going to say we need to travel to Jerusalem. we got to travel to the holy sites. we got to follow in the footsteps of Paul, and, and we got to go do all that stuff. And listen, that can be a wonderful thing. I mean, that could be a great thing for you to do. I've often thought, hey, what a, it'd be great to go on a Mediterranean cruise, right, and see all those spots, you know, enjoy the cruise, go to the spot, see them, follow in the footsteps of Paul, be wonderful. But no, that's not what I'm going to say. In fact... Traveling to holy sites is actually not a means of grace. It's not something that God is going to say, by going to that place, you're going to become a a mature person. You're going to be completely different spiritually. Now, I loved, I went to Israel back in October 2017, and it was a great time. But listen, if it was a means of grace where you could just wave a wand and everything's going to be great in your life and you're growing Christ, then why do most of the vast majority of people who live in those areas reject Christ? It could be a fulfilling trip for you, and you can gain a lot from it, but it's not a magic wand to cause you to grow spiritually or to keep you awake spiritually. That's not what this is. So my point isn't that we should travel more, 
But there are at least three things that I see from this passage that can keep us or help us to stay spiritually awake. And the first is this, that we are to seek out Christian encouragement. We're to seek out Christian encouragement, right? So in our study of the book of Acts, we see a pattern. Paul, uh, you know, beginning in chapter 13, is going to go on missionary journeys. He's going to take people with him friends, associates, they're with him. They travel, kind of going out in, in circles, further circles. They reach new places. They preach the gospel. He's in the synagogues. He's proclaiming Christ. He's saying how Jesus is the Christ and he'll plant a church. Then he'll move on to the next place. Oftentimes because of persecution is going to drive him to the next place. So he'll go to the next city, do the same thing. The next city, do the same thing. And then oftentimes he goes back through those same cities. And then he'll end up that missionary journey. So the book of Acts records three major missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. This is the third one that we are on, in fact, as this time in Ephesus. We've been in Ephesus now for, for several weeks. Paul has been in Ephesus and this is the third of his three major missionary journeys, and it's the same thing every time. Goes, preaches the gospel, church is planted, he'll leave, he'll come back, oftentimes he'll, he'll put elders in place to lead the church that is there, and then he'll encourage them, and he will go on his way. So before he goes to Ephesus, or before he got to Ephesus on this trip, he, where he spent their three years, we'll see that even next week, he visited churches, but why did he visit the churches that he previously planted? Well, it was to encourage them spiritually. It was to encourage them spiritually. He wanted to encourage the believers. In fact, in what we just read here in verses 20, one through six, shouldn't be a surprise to us because Paul has already told us that that's what he wanted to do. Back in chapter 19, verse 21, he said he wanted to leave. He felt the spirit leading him. He was going to go now to Macedonia and then to Greece or to Achaia. And what was he going to do? He was going to preach. He was going to encourage. He was going to clarify truth and doctrine and make sure things were going okay. And that's what we see there. He was helping churches. So in verse two, a literal translation says that through many words, through many words, Paul was encouraging them. So what was Paul saying? What were the words that Paul was saying? Well, we can assume, as I mentioned moments ago, that he was clarifying doctrine, that he was pointing people to how Jesus fulfilled the law. So no, they no longer have to follow the the rules of Judaism in order to be made right with God because Jesus fulfilled the law on their behalf. We can assume that he was warning them about false teachers and he was calling them to remain steadfast in Christ. I mean, consider the disturbance that had just happened, okay? Consider the disturbance. Right before we read these, after these things, there in chapter 20, verse one, what had just happened? Well, there was this riot or there was this supposed riot. The, the silversmith Demetrius had riled up a crowd. He was mad because Paul was preaching Jesus and their trade of selling idols was, was diminishing. And so there was this big potential riot, right? Actually, it ended up being a lot to do about nothing, right? There was this great picture of what was going to happen, kind of like a thunderstorm here in Amarillo, right? We see the weather pattern coming. We're going to get doused with rain. And then what happens? It splits around the city and comes to the other side. It's a big to do about nothing. But that's kind of what took place there. They're all in the theater. Thousands and thousands of people in, the, in Ephesus, they're in the theater. Maybe fifteen or 20,000 people. They're all chanting, great is Artemis, great is Artemis, our goddess, right? And then the town clerk comes and says, oh, don't worry, you're misunderstanding what Paul is actually preaching. He's not being true. He's bringing pseudo-peace, you recall that from last week. And then everyone just kind of dismisses well, after these things, Paul enacts what he said his plan was in that chapter 19, verse 21. He's going to go back through Macedonia. He's going to go back into Greece and Achaia, and he is going to preach, and he's going to love, and he's going to encourage the Christians who are there. So what is he saying? Well, those very things. But also, I'm sure he promised them about God's sovereignty and God's providence, how God cares for his people. Yeah, there's going to be some evil people come and there's going to be some difficulties. There's going to be some false teachers, but, but keep seeking the Lord. Keep following him because in him there is life. In Christ there is life. There is hope. There is peace in Christ. 
In a few weeks, we're going to see Paul's farewell speech listed for us in chapter 20, the second half of chapter 20. And we're going to see some of these very same themes. But here's the point. Seek out Christian encouragement to stay awake spiritually. And friends, there are a number of distractions in our lives. And we know that. There are any number of distractions in our lives that can keep us from seeking out Christian encouragement and can keep us from uh, pursuing Christ fully. But all of those distractions have one thing in common. They can serve to make us callous to the Spirit. And they can serve to kind of make us drowsy spiritually. No, we're to, we are to seek out Christian encouragement because that can be a help to keep us awake spiritually. And look, the distractions aren't necessarily evil, right? They're not necessarily inherently evil. I mean, distractions can be good things that we just kind of give an inordinate amount of attention to. They can be schedules. They can be our work. They can be our kids' athletic endeavors. They can be our hobbies. Sometimes even trying to do too much for the Lord can be a distraction to us. You remember the conversation that Jesus had with Martha and Mary? Martha was busy getting the house ready because they were hosting people and Jesus was going to teach. And Mary was just sitting there listening to Jesus. And Martha wasn't happy about that. Why? Well, because it wasn't fair. But Jesus said, no, Mary chose the good part. She's sitting at my feet. She's listening. She's hearing. She is not distracted with everything else. So friends, distractions come in a lot of ways. And some of us are struggling with distractions right now. Some of us in this room are struggling with distractions because we're too busy. We're doing too many things. And friends, I'm telling you, the warning is this. Keep it up for too long and you will grow weaker spiritually. You'll begin to become drowsy spiritually. And we're to seek Christian encouragement, to be encouraged in Christ because in Christ there is hope. In Christ we are, uh, as we pursue Christ, we are are doing that which it takes to stay awake when it comes to spiritual life. One of the things that stands out to me in this passage are the names of all the people that are traveling with Paul. Did you, you catch that? Most of you are listening to see if I pronounce them right, I know, but, <laughs> but did you catch it? Like all these people named traveling with the Apostle Paul. Why? Well, I mentioned this last week. Paul, in part of his going back to encourage these churches, he's also taking up a collection. We read this in 2 Corinthians. We read this in other passages, other epistles that he wrote. He, he's actually taking up money collection from gentile believers to take back to the church that's impoverished in jerusalem okay so he wants to minister and it's very likely that these people who are named here are representatives of those churches that he was going they were bringing the money they were with paul but here's the point they're together they're encouraging one another together in christ so listen we can't miss this the importance of being with community with the church family. I was talking to a, a, a couple who attend our church, who are members of our church earlier, and the wife has facing uh, potentially being away for like seven weeks at a time because of a PhD program. And we were talking about how difficult that would be. And the husband said, but thank God for Christian community. Thank God that we're not alone. And isn't that the truth? Thank God for Christian community where we encourage one another, where we love one another, where we point each other to Christ, where we care for one another's needs. All of this can work to help keep us awake spiritually. Now, verse 3 says that Paul was going to sail to Syria. Syria is kind of the northernmost part of the Middle East area right there. Uh, Jerusalem is here. You keep going up, and then you get to Syria. Syria is kind of the northernmost part of that Mediterranean sea, the northeast part of the Mediterranean Sea. So why Syria? Well, actually, Paul wants to get to Jerusalem, but apparently the ship that he was going to get on there in Corinth was going to travel across this way and get to Syria, but ultimately he was going to travel down to Jerusalem. We know that he wanted to be there by Pentecost. So Paul was on his way, and then he hears of something. He hears of a plot. 
Okay, so that's going to change his plans. But actually what that does, it allows him more Christian encouragement. So he goes back up, up through Greece, up in the Macedonia. And then he begins this travel all the way down across the little inlet there. And then over to the area of Asia, which is now Asia Minor. And to Ephesus, which is where Turkey is. Okay, so that's what is going on. That's what Paul did That's what all the apostles did. That's what Jesus promoted. That's what we see in the New Testament. That's what we see in the New Testament church. This idea of Christian encouragement. The idea of Christian community. And if you are going to stay awake spiritually, if you want to thrive spiritually, then you need ongoing Christian encouragement. Did you hear that? Ongoing This isn't a one and done. This isn't a one and done. How many times did Paul visit these churches over and over again, okay? And friends, without Christian encouragement, we run the risk of falling asleep spiritually. And we can be so deceived that we think we're awake, but we're really like a zombie. We're just walking through the motions. And we don't see our own sin. And we become so self-righteous thinking that we're fine, everything's great, look at all these sinners out there, but no one is actually speaking into our lives. No one's actually helping us to understand where maybe we aren't getting it right, maybe where we're being judgmental, maybe where we're being unloving because, you know, we just kind of keep it to ourselves. Friends, that's why it's so important for you to be connected. It's why it's so important for you to be plugged in. It's why being part of a Bible fellowship group is really important where you can connect with other people. That's why being part of a small group is an important aspect because you can actually talk about how scripture is is, uh, applicable to your life and to your situation. This is where you can encourage one another and pray for one another. We had a family in our small group who had to go to the hospital kind of unexpectedly and one of the group members in our class sent out a sent out a meal train thing, right? So, hey, let's love this family. They're hurting, they're suffering. Let's love this family. Let's care for this family. We need those kind of things in our lives to help us to stay awake spiritually. So seek Christian encouragement. But next, prioritize God's word. Prioritize God's word. So three months, we're told that the Apostle Paul and his companions are in Greece, likely Achaia, likely Corinth, and we read that he was going to travel, sail across to go over to Asia, ultimately to get to Jerusalem. Now, three months, we don't really know how long it was there. Some scholars would say this this trip, when he left Ephesus, could have been a whole year. He could have been gone a year. He could have been in Macedonia for a long time. He could have been in all these different churches for several times, but we know he was there in Greece or in Corinth for three months. And then he was going to go. So a lot of people think he was there over the winter months when he couldn't travel back over because he wanted to get to to Jerusalem for Pentecost, right? So after Passover, 40 days, then we have Pentecost. So that would be the time frame. But Paul learns of a plot of the Jews against him. Now you recall he left Corinth the first time because of a plot of the Jews. Now perhaps this plot had to do with the sailing trip, right? The trip all the way to Syria and then to Jerusalem. So maybe they were, their plot had to do with something with the ship and he would be unprotected. Well, he says, scrap those plans. We're going a different way. So now he travels back up through the areas that he had just come in order to get to uh, ultimately Miletus where he will then set sail and he will go on to um, Syria and then to Jerusalem. Now, In verses 7 through 12, we read of this interesting story, don't we? This interesting story of a guy named Eutychus. So Paul is there in Troas, and for seven days, and in verse 6, we read that he was wanting to leave, and the next day he wanted to leave, and so he's got this church together in Troas, and they're in a third story room and he's preaching the gospel and he's really long-winded okay so that's that's the setting now there's this interesting detail here a strange detail about the lamps being lit right like okay the lights are on 
That would be like someone describing our service today saying, hey, baptisms are great, music was wonderful, preaching was eh, and the lights were on, right? That's, that's kind of what it would be like. Why do we learn about these lights? However, Luke is purposeful in the way that he writes this. This detail about the lamp is important because it adds to the story, perhaps helping to explain why this young man, some scholars would say he was probably 14 or less, fell asleep during Paul's teaching. Well, the, the, the point would be that the lamps were burning and they were using up oxygen. It was a crowded room. It was probably warm in the room and this young man didn't have as much oxygen he needed and he fell asleep. It could have been that, or it could have just been that Paul was long-winded and boring. We don't know exactly. By the way, I'm all too familiar with this, okay? And I wish I could blame it on burning lamps, but I can't. My guess is the fact that some of you fall asleep or are sleeping right now is more because of me than the environment in the room, right? But the pattern, the pattern really repeats itself over and over, right? Eyes become heavy and drowsy. And then you kind of start nodding your head a little bit, right? And then you wake up and you, and you think you're okay, but you're really not. And then your spouse jabs you in the rib cage and then your eyes are wide open, but some of you make it through that spousal jab, right? And you don't wake up until your Bible hits the floor. (laughs) And then that's usually followed by someone mouthing, yes, I do read lips. I was just praying. I was was just praying. (laughs) And by the way, it is my duty to warn you. This is my duty, okay? If you fall asleep in here and something really bad happens to you like you die, I don't have Paul's gifting, okay? I can't bring you (laughs) back to life. So stay awake. Well, thankfully, Paul does bring this young man back to life, right? And the church is very excited about it, very happy about it. For whatever reason, Eutychus falls asleep. But I really want you to notice what's actually happening in that moment, okay? What's actually happening in that moment is they're centering themselves on God's word. Paul is teaching God's word. The church is gathered around God's word. Paul is teaching What is he teaching? Very likely some of the the very same themes that I mentioned earlier here. Now this is closely connected to Christian encouragement, but I want to focus on the necessity of being under God's word. That's why Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 that we are to be under the word of God, right? To long for the pure spiritual milk of the word so that by it we may grow in respect to salvation. Being under the word of God. Because through the word of God, we grow in Christ-likeness. Because of the spirit of God applying the word of God to our hearts, we grow in sanctification. We grow, we die to sin and we live to righteousness. Church, we can't underestimate the importance of God's word. Because God's word is our spiritual lifeblood. In the same way that if If you don't have blood in your body, you're not going to make it physically. If you don't have God's word in your life, you're not going to make it spiritually. You're not going to grow spiritually. We cannot be growing Christians if we neglect God's word. We can't be growing Christians if we we, uh, move away from God's word. If we neglect God's word. Because it's through God's word that God's spirit transforms us. So James tells us, James chapter one, verse 18, that he made us spiritually alive according to his will by the word of truth, right? This is the gospel. And beyond that, James calls us to receive the word with meekness because it is able to save our souls. So this is what God's word is calling us to place ourselves under. This is what God is saying is so important in your life. Friends, if you wanna stay awake spiritually, then center your life on God's word. If you wanna stay awake spiritually, then center your life on God's word. In Acts chapter 20, which again, we'll get to here in a few weeks, I want you to hear what Paul says to the elders of the church in Ephesus as he says his farewell speech. So look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. Uh, Paul is talking about how he has been there serving. Verse 20, 
how I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Now skip down to verse 25. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. What is Paul saying? He's saying, look, when I was there with you for three years, we centered everything on God's word. Everything on the authoritative, inerrant word of God. Now, we understand they didn't have the Bible like we did there, but Paul was teaching the word of God. Paul was teaching truth. As an apostle, Paul was teaching the very things that we're studying today, the very things that we read when we center our lives on the word of God. Yes, Jesus did many things in his life as he lived on this earth, and many of the things he did were more social in nature, right? He healed people, he cast out demons, he fed people. Yes, he did these things, but the primary thing he did, and when he described what his ministry was, it was to proclaim the kingdom of God, to proclaim the kingdom of heaven. That's why he said, I must go to the other villages, I must go to the other places so that I can proclaim the gospel, I can teach the word. And we think we can grow a church today through gimmicks, and we think we can grow a church by just catering to the lost world, And we think that we need less of God's word so we can be more relevant. I'd argue that we'll grow something utilizing those strategies, but it's not going to be a church made of growing Christians. It's not going to be a church that's made of people who love Jesus and want to be more and more like him. And yes, I know it's not easy. In a world that despises truth and rejects the gospel, and likens scripture to fantasy land or likens scripture to fairy tales, people will increasingly look down on you because of your beliefs. They will look down on you if you hold fast to the word of God. They will. It's inevitable. But if you want to stay awake spiritually, if you want to be saved in the end, then stay awake and hold fast to the word of God because the word of God is able to save your souls. Don't minimize the word of God. Don't minimize it. Humble yourself and ask God to give you desire and a discipline to stay in his word, to be in the word. Spend time thinking about what you have read and ask God to change you. Finally, to stay awake spiritually, go with the gospel. Go with the gospel. Maybe that's the most obvious point from this whole text, right? Because they're all going somewhere. They've all been going and now they're continuing going and they all want to get somewhere. Why? Because they're ministering, because they're loving, because they're serving, because they understand the importance of the gospel, right? Doctors say that steady exercise can help you overcome feelings of fatigue. I know that seems really counterintuitive, doesn't it? Like if you feel tired, go exercise. Start exercising, build up that energy, that that stamina, begin to do it. And the same is true spiritually. If you feel spiritually fatigued, if you feel spiritually fatigued, then exercise your faith. Exercise your faith. Begin to serve, begin to love, begin to engage with others. The apostles, the missionaries, and the believers in Acts were constantly going with the gospel. They were staying awake spiritually. Why? because they were constantly exercising their faith. They were speaking and living the gospel. They were loving others. And look, when your heart is on fire for Jesus, it's not difficult to stay awake. When your heart is on fire for Jesus, it is not difficult to stay awake. And when I say go with the gospel, I could mean go across the street. I could mean go over to the next cubicle in your office. I could mean, students, go to the next classroom or across your own classroom. Or I could mean go to another country. I could mean go to Thailand with the bonards around Christmas to distribute blankets in villages to speak the gospel there in remote parts of northern Thailand and surrounding countries. Or I could mean go to Taiwan to serve with the Blackhurst and the Scoggins and disciple young believers and proclaim Christ to non-believers. And by the way, this Tuesday night, Todd Blackhurst, former 
Many, I don't want to take this for granted anymore. Many of you know this, but some of you are new and you don't know this. Todd Blackhurst is a former member and staff member of our church and several years ago began Mission Taiwan, a ministry that our church is very involved with and supports. Um, and he will be here Tuesday night. He's hosting something in The Rock. You'll hear more about this in a minute. And then he's actually preaching next Sunday here. So we're excited to have them here. And this is where Zach and Allison Scoggin are preparing to go to serve on that team and we're excited about them just praying that God will work out the final details for them as they continue to await all the process to work itself out with their, with their visas. Or it could mean going to Peru to train pastors and church leaders. Or it could mean going to Provo to reach the lost with the gospel, many of whom think they're okay spiritually, but they're just deceived. It could mean going on trips to explore other opportunities, maybe in Israel, maybe in Turkey, or maybe in places like Spain, where we now have contacts, friends who are serving, and maybe the God would open the door for us to go and serve in those occasions. We don't know for sure. But of course, it does mean here at Trinity Baptist Church, because this is your home church, and God has called you to serve and to exercise your spiritual gifts for the building up of the body of Christ here at Trinity Baptist Church. How are you engaged? Doesn't mean you're a teacher, it's okay, not everyone's a teacher. But there are ways for you to connect, to get involved, to serve, because that's what God would have you do. Now let me be clear, serving alone isn't gonna keep you awake spiritually. Not in a healthy way, okay? But serving in conjunction with what we've already said, Christian encouragement and sending your life on the word of God will help to keep you spiritually awake. That's how this works. That's what God does in our lives. These things, as an overflow of our lives, help us to remain spiritually awake. So church, let's be a church that purposefully pursues Christ, that loves the gospel so much that we speak it and that we live it, and that is part of our daily lives. And let's be motivated by the fact that Jesus loved us enough to die on the cross for our sin, to make us spiritually alive for those who have put their hope and trust in Christ. Friends, as we transition into a time of response, if you do not know Jesus Christ, if you don't have a relationship with him, a relationship with the one true and living God, but yet you want to know more about how you can be saved, how you can have forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life because it only comes through faith in Christ, then this would be a time for you to come and to talk to me or one of our staff members and we would love to connect with you about that. Or maybe catch us out in the hallway, the foyer, or call the church or contact the church. If you're watching online right now, feel free to send us a message. You can find uh, ways to contact us either on our website or even there on the connect card button. We would love to connect with you. We would love to share with you how you can know Christ. But in this room right now, some of us need to take time to just to repent because we have not been doing the things that will help us to stay spiritually awake. In fact, we've been neglecting those things. We've been neglecting those things and some of us right now are about to fall asleep spiritually because of our neglect of what God has called us to do, to be. So maybe you want to spend time asking God for energy and grace so that you might seek him more fully in this room. Some of you want to pray for your family right now. Some of you have people that you're engaging or seeking to engage with the gospel who are far from Christ and you want to pray right now that God would open up their hearts and their eyes to to receive, to see, to receive and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you in this room are trusting in Christ and you wanna come because you wanna, you wanna be baptized, you wanna celebrate, you, want the, you wanna say, I'm in Christ and I want to be baptized and we wanna rejoice with you in that. Maybe there's some in this room who have finished the membership process and, and you're ready to join with this church family and today would be a day that you could come and tell us that, share with the church and we would love to greet you. God is definitely at work, friends. God, amen? amen? How is he at work in your life right now? Let's pray together. God, thank you that you are at work. Thank you that you never sleep nor slumber. And we pray that we would live in such a way, that we would live in such a way that, that proves that we are longing after you. We pray, Father, that your grace would be sufficient in our lives as we know it's been promised to us. 
that even in difficulty, we would cling to you. We would seek Christian encouragement. We would center our lives on the word of God and that we would go with the gospel. God, do this in us. Do this through us and do it for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand and sing and respond? How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of sin beautiful message we just sang about that we know with all of our hearts and with all of our lives that his wounds have paid the ransom that we owed not that we can merit on our own but because of his deep love for us we cannot fathom how deep it is but let us go to him in prayer as we leave this place in a couple minutes let's run to him knowing that he loves us and he desires that we come to him with our request and he desires that we bring our lives to him. Let's pray. Our loving Father who art in heaven, how great is your love for us and how little is our love for you because of our sinful nature. We thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us alone with no way to be saved. But out of your deep love for us, you sent your one and only son to die for us. 
It is by his wounds that the ransom has been paid. Christ has paid the debt we can never afford. Lord, we can never fully understand the beauty and the depth of your love for us. But it was on display in Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection. And Lord, we thank you that he did not stay in the grave. But because he is risen, he is risen your word promises that all who confess their sins to you and believe in his name, they will be saved and will be forgiven. Just as the baptisms that we uh, saw earlier, just what they represent, Lord, that those who believe have been risen, have risen with Christ from death to the newness of life because of his finished work. And Lord, as we just sang, we thank you for your deep love for us. And I pray that our boast would be in you and in you alone. Be glorified now and forevermore, we pray that you would increase and that we would decrease. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may now be seated for a few announcements. Trinity Baptist Church exists to proclaim Christ and make disciples of those who claim Christ all for the glory of Christ. One of the ways you uh, do this is through your faithful giving. We thank you for your giving. If you'd like to give an offering today, you can either go to our church's website and give online. You can bring an offering to the, church's, uh, to the church office uh, throughout the week, except tomorrow. We're closed tomorrow. Um, I mean, you can if you want to and slide in the door. But anyways, or you could give it to the, uh, put it in the giving boxes as you leave the worship center today. One of the ways your giving supports the ministries of this church is enables us to, uh, have, uh, to study scripture and to commune together. One of these opportunities is our ladies' Bible study. So if you please direct your attention to the screens, we have a short promotional video for you. Hi, I'm Jen Wilkin, and I want to invite you to join me for my study, God of Deliverance. Join me it's a 10-session study over the first 18 chapters of Exodus, which are 18 of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. They're going to walk us through the story of how Israel was freed from slavery in Egypt by the strong and mighty hand of God. They're going to walk us through the story of how Israel was freed from slavery in Egypt This is a story that helps us to understand the rest of the Bible as a whole. This is a story that helps us to understand I don't know exactly what she was going to say, but I'll tell you what I was going to say. Um, this fall, uh, the ladies' Bible study is going to be walking through um, the book of Exodus, and it begins this on September 7th and September 8th, a Wednesday morning where child care is provided, and Thursday evening, no child care provided. Uh, we are also looking for two more volunteers to help with child care, so if you would like to uh, serve the church and help with that, please talk with Melissa Riley, ASAP. That would be greatly appreciated. And as Nate mentioned in his sermon, uh, we are having a Mission Taiwan meeting this Tuesday night at 6.30 in the Rock Auditorium. Todd Blackhurst will be there. He'll be giving an update on what the ministry is going to look like in Taiwan. Um, we may even hear from Zach and Allison if we're blessed enough. Um, no, I'm just kidding. They'll be there. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Mission Taiwan or just to hear, get an update on the ministry, we'd love to see you there. Rock Auditorium, Tuesday evening, 6.30 p.m. And Talk Blackhurst will be preaching for us next Sunday. Looking forward to that. As uh, Speaking of Sundays, tonight it is Labor Day weekend, so we do not have any uh, evening activities tonight. So you can come if you want to. You'll be alone and you'll pray alone, but remember the Holy Spirit's with you. Um, and lastly, before we finish, I just want to, up here at the front will be Danny Bertram. Danny has come up to, um, for baptism. At camp this year, Danny gave her life to Christ, and I've seen her grow this summer through that. And so we're in the process of working with her and uh, discipling her, and she will be working on scheduling a date for her baptism. But please be encouraged that we have another saint in the kingdom. And... and And as for us, also be encouraged when John writes as we finish up in Revelation 5.13. It says, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. 
As you enjoy your Labor Day weekend, be safe, spend it with friends, spend it with family, but remember the one who loves you and the one who sits on the throne. You are dismissed.